I'm Psyche Truth correspondent Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Dr. Colin Ross, an author and practicing psychiatrist based out of Dallas, Texas. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Today I would like to talk about the role of childhood trauma and how that might relate to psychological disorders later in life. Sure. Can you just talk a little bit? I know that you um, have a lot of information and research that you've done about the role of trauma and how it affects people later on in their lives. Can you just give us a little information well, on that? My basic view, which is supported by a lot of research, but is not accepted by all psychiatrists, is that trauma is like the main thing going on in the mental health field in the form of childhood physical sexual abuse, childhood neglect, family violence, and if we walk around the globe, that would include war, huge disease rates, countries where half the adult population almost is HIV positive. Uh, so really bad, serious things that are disturbing children over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing behind the bulk of mental health problems. And it's not just this problem or that problem or that problem, but the mental health field in general. Very interesting. So in terms of sexual abuse and childhood trauma, um, one of the things that we see is that there's this recurring of the person to get themselves in abusive you know, situations. Can you speak to that at all? Well, that's actually pretty easy to understand. If you've grown up in a family where everybody speaks English all the time, you end up in the pattern of speaking English. If you grow up in a family where everybody likes to hunt and fish, the odds are you're going to hunt and fish. If you've learned that your role in life is to be an object for sexual use by others and abuse, you just kind of learn that pattern and it carries on until it gets interrupted by some sort of recovery process. Um, so it's what you're taught. It's what you believe about yourself. Also, clearly, if your father's having sex with you, there's a problem with boundaries in the family. So you don't learn healthy boundaries, how to keep people from invading your personal space. You don't have the normal coping strategies and defenses. So then there's all kinds of predators out there. They sense that you're a willing victim and they're on you. So there's many kind of factors that all lead to this pattern continuing and continuing. So what kind of research has been done about the effects of childhood abuse or sexual abuse? There's actually quite a lot of research now. And childhood sexual abuse is a risk factor for That means it increases the odds that you'll have a given problem. So clearly, if you have a childhood sexual abuse history, your risk of having depression at least doubles. If you have a childhood sexual abuse history, your risk of psychosis and schizophrenia goes up. And there's in the last five years, a whole series of large studies pointing to that conclusion, which was completely not possible, not accepted 20 years ago. So there's a whole variety of different mental health problems that you're more likely to have if you've been sexually abused as a child. That's interesting. And then so it would seem that most children who have you know, that kind of past, that kind of childhood, as they're growing into adults, how are those effects, you know, how does that play into them eventually receiving a mental health diagnosis? Well, if you've been treated horribly, uh, it's not like there's ever a family where everything's fine, but dad's having sex with the daughter. It just doesn't happen. There's always a whole bunch of problems in the family. So usually there's, besides the sexual abuse itself, there's some sort of emotional abuse, verbal abuse. There's often physical violence. There's certainly failure to protect the individual. So the dad fails to protect the daughter from himself. The mom fails to protect the daughter from the dad. And the mom herself may be emotionally or verbally abusive. So <clears throat> from all these different angles, you're learning the lesson. You're not lovable. You don't have intrinsic dignity or worth. You're just an object for use and abuse, and you can be discarded if necessary. So then you end up with a whole set of ingrained beliefs. I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'm just there for use and abuse, and I might as well let everybody go at it. And so you can, it's not much of a jump from there to being clinically depressed and feeling lousy, feeling suicidal, the world would be better off without you. It's not much of a jump to 
this is totally unbearable, so I think I'll get drunk or shoot heroin. Or maybe I'll just focus on weight, food, weight, food, weight, food, and I won't have to think about all that other stuff or feel it. And as you discussed in the multiple personality video that we did, um, yeah, kind of that inability to face your reality or to face the really difficult things that can often end up manifesting in somebody having a multiple personality. Right. And the, the basic idea is, why would a kid have trouble facing reality? What's wrong with that kid? Well, my view is, who wouldn't have trouble facing that reality when you hear these horrible childhoods? And you have to disconnect it from it somehow. <clears throat> so if you're four or seven or eight, you can't disconnect by moving to the next town. You only you can't disconnect by telling dad to stop. So the only way you can disconnect from the reality of what's going on is to disconnect internally, mm -hmm. which means disconnect from yourself, from the feelings. And so this disconnecting internally is a very common theme. And the biggest, most elaborate form of disconnecting is having different people inside to take care of it. Right. So you spoke on the break about a study involving monkeys where they were actually examining how different childhood experiences affected them. Can you talk a little bit more about that? There's actually now monkey and mice and rat research. So the monkey experiments are the Harlow monkey experiments, which are very famous. They're in all the different psychology textbooks. And Harlow was the chief psychologist. So that's where you have a bunch of monkeys and some of them get a normal childhood. The next group, instead of a normal mother, they've got a wire cage for a mom that they try and hug, and, but this wire cage doesn't give them any love back. And they find then that these monkeys have certain behavioral problems. They step that up by having a wire cage mother who had pneumatic jets attached to it, which gave a really you know big puff of air. It was very scary to the monkey. So this was now a mom who was cold, emotionally unavailable, non-nurturing, and actively physically abusive. And what they saw is, compared to the monkeys with just the wire cage mom, those monkeys clung even harder for longer. Wow. So the desperation, and it's kind of a love-hate approach avoid conflict, basically. Right. You don't want to be around mom because she's emotionally neglecting you and actively frightening you and abusing you. But that makes you even more desperate to be around mom, so you cling even harder. Right. And you get this back and forth conflicted attachment pattern. Yeah. In um, uh, another set of monkey experiments, they basically had the normal, regular childhood monkeys and then abuse neglect monkeys, all same genetic kind of group of monkeys. And then they let these monkeys grow up to adulthood and they didn't really look different. You couldn't really, by looking at them, tell the difference by their coats or by their grooming or their behavior. But what they did then as adults is they gave both groups amphetamines. So the monkeys who had a normal childhood, they didn't really react in any particular fashion. Exactly the same genetic group. The only difference was they had all this abuse and neglect as kids. When you gave them amphetamines, they flew into a rage and murdered their cage mates. Wow. So now let's take this observation and send it to a, grang, a gang neighborhood or a crack neighborhood somewhere in the United States where you have people taking amphetamines, flying into rages, and killing their opposing gang members. So th these experiments are giving us a window into the biology and the psychology and the behavior of childhood trauma and how it rolls out decade after decade after decade. Wow. And more recently, in 1990s into the 2000s, there's experiments with uh, mice where it's all the same breed of mouse. And you, again, you've got the normal childhood mice and the mice have been taken away from their moms and stressed. And what we're finding now is we're starting to be able to track some biological dysregulation that happens in the cortisol system, which is can causally for sure scientifically be known to be caused by the trauma. So this is actually, to me, the first time that biological psychiatry is starting to make a bit of sense. That it's not that these monkeys are genetically abnormal compared to these monkeys. They're the same strain. What they're showing is the normal response of the body, the mind, the brain, the behavior to child abuse. So I think if we start looking into not people who are genetically defective, who have, are born with diseases, 
but people who are more or less genetically normal and they're showing an understandable reaction to a whole lot of trauma, abuse, violence, and neglect, then we might be able to start picking up on some of how that works in your cortisol system, in your brain, how your brain processes information. So it's a, it's a different model. It's basically based on you are normal to start with, and you know if you fall out of an airplane without a parachute at 10,000 feet, you're not going to be looking too normal when you hit the ground. But who wouldn't look that way? Same thing with you know, when you're in a childhood with a lot of trauma and no parachute. So that's interesting. So in essence, what these studies are finding is that, you know, the effects of childhood, the nature versus nurture, the nature, the environment can actually have physical effects. Right. That's pretty much a known scientific fact now. Right. It's not just a theory anymore. And so psychiatry, like everything, it's, you know, the pendulum goes this way, the pendulum goes that way. So in psychiatry, the pendulum was way over towards Freud and psychoanalysis. Now it's swung way over towards this, it's about your genes and your brain chemicals model. And it just needs to come back a lot more over this way to really what's going on in the environment's got a lot to do with it. Right. And after 50 years, we still haven't found any specific genetic problem that we can identify that consistently leads to a certain DSM diagnosis. Right. So as a psychiatrist, what kind of advice might you give someone who does have abuse or sexual abuse in their past and who is either experiencing depression or experiencing something to that effect? Well, the, the psychotherapy and the recovery process can take years, so... Quick advice that never cured anything, but basically what I would say is just because you were treated badly as a child doesn't mean that you deserved it and doesn't mean that you are fundamentally a bad person. That's a lesson that you think would be obvious, but it's very hard to unlearn this lesson that you are nobody and nothing. Second thing is what you're experiencing in life is a bunch of serious problems and some of your behavior and your coping strategies are not totally healthy. But that's understandable given what you've come through. So what you're experiencing is a kind of an understandable, normal human being reaction to what you've been through. It's not evidence that you're some sort of genetically defective person. And then the third thing is you weren't responsible for, you couldn't control what was going on in a childhood. But now as an adult, you can take responsibility for what you do, the choices you make, who you hang out with, what drugs you do or don't take whether you do or don't get into therapy. And if you get into therapy and actually work hard, it's realistically possible you could make a really impressive, amazing recovery. That's actually realistically possible. And you've had experiences. I've seen that many, many times. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. That's about all we have time for. I want to thank you for tuning in. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, I hope that you will give me a thumbs up and click on that like button. I hope that you'll leave your comments, questions below, and be sure to subscribe to Psyche Truth so you can catch all of our future videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.